so very open to that. Um, before I jump into the lesson, though, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about the food bank. Um, the good news is that the community has been incredibly generous and supportive in uh, what has been one of the most critical food insecurity times uh, in Hall County and in the five county service region that we are the food banks responsible for. Um, we know about 50,000 people in the five county area, which would be Hall, Lumpkin, Union, Forsyth, and uh, Dawson counties um, are facing food insecurity. Uh, about 38% of the people that we serve are children who uh, don't know where their next meal uh, will be coming from. We've been able to work with the uh, school system um, and through the junior league to um, uh, make sure that kids uh, have access to food in the absence of uh, school lunches and after snack programs. And um, uh, the reality is that the poverty rate in Gainesville uh, hovers around 25 to 26 percent in Hall County. Right now it's 13.2. It's been as high as uh, 16.2 this year. Um, and so the poverty rate both in Hall and Gainesville far exceeds any other area that we serve. And uh, the, the challenges have been uh, enormous. Uh, at the peak in uh, May, we were having to serve five times as many people as we did at a, that same time a year ago. It's uh, now at about three times the uh, uh, normal rate. Um, and I was sharing with Robert earlier that uh, a lot of our retail, our, our food comes from donations from the retail industry. And um, uh, most months that's about 80%, but uh, in April it had dropped to uh, 30%. And uh, we were faced with the um, challenges of, of actually having to buy food. And, a truckload of food cost about $135,000. So feeding people um, is both a responsibility and a generous act, but it's, it's something that uh, costs a lot to uh, process. And so we appreciate the support of um, so many, so many wonderful people who have stepped up to make sure that uh, people have access to food. Uh, we continue to hear stories from elderly of having to choose between the medications they need for quality life and having the funds to get food just to get through the day. And so we want to continue to work through that uh, what food is, is even more fundamental than reading. And so we want to make sure that kids have uh, healthy food, um, try to get to them low sodium and, and healthy uh, 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 vegetables that they can enjoy. And so we just appreciate your prayers and continued support and, um, and just be mindful that um, one in five, um, 20% 20, 20 of the, the population um, just literally doesn't know where they're going to get their next meal. And um, so we thank you for your prayers and encouragement. And um, I know many of you are involved through the Jubilee Farm and uh, that's a tremendous um, uh, access point for us to be able to get those fresh vegetables and um, just never uh, underestimate the impact that your goodness has uh, on those who, who are in need. So with uh, that, we'll uh, move into the um, lesson. And uh, I wasn't sure what uh, 
I would do this time typically with you all. I um, like to discuss a piece of art, but I, I wasn't sure how well that would go over in a Zoom kind of world and uh, had no idea Robert had the uh, incredible ca studio capacity mm -hmm. as I might have uh, rethought, but um, um, I uh, kept thinking about what I would want to do. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, as a Baptist, I come out of this tradition where um, the word is regarded by many as uh, inerrant and infallible. And um, I, I remember a professor of mine would uh, read certain passages and then he would always end it by saying, this too is the word of God. And, um, and so there are enormous, uh, uh, or I shouldn't say enormous, but many, many uh, texts, particularly within the Old Testament, some in the New, but particularly in the Old of um, um, just, just rascals and uh, bad behavior. And, um, and what do you do with that? And, um, and as Christians, how do we learn from those texts and the behavior of those who have gone before us and apply it in a way that um, contributes to uh, the kingdom? And so um, I have a, a series of uh, lessons. Uh, the, the overarching title is... Um, uh, Bible stories for adults only, and um, and then I've picked a number of texts. Uh, you know, David and Bathsheba would be one of those. Uh, the rape of uh, Tamar is uh, another one, and um, and this the first in that series is uh, a lesson uh, titled Noah exposes himself, and so. I wanted to look at that, uh, particularly because of the uh, implications for racial divide and, um, and to see what we might learn from the weakness of Noah that would um, open us to a uh, healthier uh, way, uh, a, a way of, of more light um, for us to follow. So, um, Robert, I kind of jumped right in and I've already messed you up, but that was the uh, first slide. And, um, and the second slide, why the need for such a study? And I've elaborated on a little bit of that. Um, uh, and this data is a few years old, but Gallup uh, says that 38% of people in the United States believe the Bible to be God's actual word. 45% believe it to be God's inspired word and 83% believe it to be God's actual word or God's <laughs> inspired mm -hmm. word. And, and the question that I, I want you to be asking yourselves is um, what is in my biblical canon? We, we, in a Christian tradition and a Protestant tradition, refer to the... Uh, books of the Old Testament and to the New as the biblical canon, but then there's so many passages that um, we don't read, we don't um, ponder, we don't include, and, um, and so the, the real question for people of faith is what's in your canon, and why are certain scriptures um, <coughs> vital to who you are as a person of faith and why are certain scriptures um, irrelevant and what does it say about your perspective your ethics your um, uh, focus when you choose certain texts and uh, you you ignore others um, and uh, for me I mean the the great uh, commandment of uh, the two commandments that Jesus left us with, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, 
become the lens through which I interpret uh, all scripture and uh, are the lens through which uh, my, my faith is, um, is something, the, the, the lens through which uh, my faith is um, perceived. And so what, what would be your focal passage? What drives your faith? Um, and I would venture to say that most of us don't think about Noah exposing himself. And uh, certainly most of us don't see that as the lens through which we uh, move uh, and live and have our being. So Robert, let's uh, turn to the scripture itself, if you don't mind. Next slide. So the, this is Genesis 9, 18 through 29. The sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was peopled. Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it, both, uh, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Curse be Canaan, lowest of all slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God make space for Japheth and let him live in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his slave. All right, Robert, if you'll go to the next slide. So um, we've got a profile of contrast where um, uh, Genesis 6, 9, the man who walked with God, uh, lies naked and drunk now. And the question is, what do we learn from that? And what does it say about our own lives and those places where we have walked with God, but yet uh, other times in our lives where we have um, uh, let our ourselves um, be exposed? And um, is it, uh, a, a lesson that we can learn that Noah could have uh, be the, the person of a covenantal relationship with God and yet be the same person who now lies uh, naked and drunk. And um, I wouldn't want us to overlook uh, this tension or just fly by it, but I'd, I'd like to just ponder that moment and encourage you in your own lives uh, to reflect over the places where you have walked with God and the places where you have um, metaphorically uh, been naked and uh, drunk, or maybe literally. Um, but um, to, to think, you know, not just about how could Noah do this, that's one question we can ponder, but in our own lives, how is it that we, we do it too? And when you wonder what is the purpose of this text, what can it, uh, how can it be applied to my life? I think when you start to think existentially, not just about what this might have meant, but what it means now for me and how am I Noah who walks with God and how am I Noah who doesn't walk with God? Perhaps there's something here that we can begin to, to draw from, but also to take comfort in that if God could continue to work with Noah and continue to call Noah, then, then God can do the same with you and me. Um, 
Robert, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, and would it would anyone like to uh, venture in at this point and make a comment, or are we good to keep going? Keep going. Okay. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the, Robert, if you'll pop that next slide back up, the uh, tensions. Um, uh, and I do have a question for you. Um, what is, why would uh, the biblical narrative keep talking about uh, Ham in relationship to, uh, to Cain? Anybody, anybody have an answer? Feel free to unmute yeah, feel free to unmute yourselves. And if you, uh, because this is an important point, um, maybe the better way to ask it is, is what's the story of Cain and Abel? Okay. Y'all are not an engaged group this morning. I, uh, um, uh, so, uh, who was Cain? Anybody? What did Cain do to Abel? Yeah. He killed him. And, um, uh, and so Cain is cursed. Um, now Ham is cursed. Um, uh, part of the uh, narrative here is that Cain offered fruit from the ground and Abel offered uh, a slain lamb and... Um, uh, and uh, there are all kinds of uh, narratives tied to, to the Baal worship and the agrarian culture of those who worshiped uh, a false god. And, um, and so here you've got Abel and um, uh, the honoring of Abel and the legacy that uh, he will provide. And, um, and so Ham now falls into the tradition of uh, Cain and the curse continues. So Robert, if you go to the next slide. Um, uh, and let's just talk about uh, briefly Noah lying naked. Of course, you remember that uh, Adam and Eve when uh, they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were aware of their own nakedness. Um, and then Shem and Japheth, two of Noah's sons, they, they carry a robe to cover their father, but they, they walk backwards uh, with their heads facing the front of the tent. And, uh, and it's Ham that um, um, when he looks at his father, um, uh, does the act that will in, evoke Noah's curse on him. But here also in the nakedness, we uh, see a lack of uh, control from Noah and uh, certainly a uh, lack of judgment. So let's go to the next uh, slide. And uh, I wanted, um, we've talked about this in other uh, uh, places, but this was uh, Michelangelo's um, uh, fresco on the ceiling of the uh, Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, and I won't elaborate on it, but I do want um, you just to take a quick note at this, and then Robert, if you'll go to the next slide, um, and we've, we've talked about this schematic before, um, but just uh, uh, to highlight something I think is interesting that for Michelangelo, the very first um, um, slide or, or panel is Noah exposing himself. And that's all in, all the way in contrast with the last panel on the right where God divides uh, light from darkness. And so for Michelangelo, uh, one of the symbols of fallenness, one of the symbols of uh, darkness, one of the um, um, acts of degradation that he regarded as, as the, one of the clearest examples of the depravity of hum humanity was this, this drunken state of uh, Noah that is 
in juxtaposition to God's ability to, to bring about light. So that, that's an interesting uh, side panel, um, but um, uh, I just think it's an incredible piece of art and it's an interesting uh, point to ponder why rather than with the fallenness of Adam and Eve, that he would begin with the um, drunkenness of uh, Noah. Um, and Robert, let's go on to the next slide after that. And then this was just uh, by um, Bellini, another um, uh, uh, Renaissance painting of the um, drunkenness of Noah. And uh, interestingly, you see uh, Ham on the uh, left who has far darker skin uh, than the others. And so I wanna, Robert, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and, uh, and so the question then is what did Ham do? Um, he broke the Levitical code that stipulates, none of you shall approach to any that is near to kin to him to uncover their nakedness. And, and Ham should have, have done what Shem and Japheth did, but uh, he um, looked at his father, he uh, reported to his brothers what he saw, and um, the biblical text doesn't go into great detail, it just says when Noah awoke from his wine, I uh, knew what his youngest son had done to him, and so we don't know how he became aware, but certainly um, he, he focuses his anger on Ham. So Robert, let's go to the next slide. And, and then this is the curse of Canaan. Uh, Noah punishes Ham's act of infidelity by cursing his son. Canaan and all of his descendants, the relegated position of servitude. Uh, and then according to tradition, Ham was black. There's no evidence in scripture where this um, is documented, but, um, but somehow through the uh, development of the narrative, Ham is regarded as black. And, um, and this is important because in the Civil War time, uh, many uh, pastors, Richard Furman, uh, Robert being one of them. Robert and I are alums of Furman University, and um, uh, and Richard Furman was a great uh, Baptist uh, pastor in the 19th century. But uh, according to many pastors like Furman, um, because Ham was cursed and it was attributed that Ham was black, this became the justification for not only the subjugation of the uh, Negro race, but or the African American or black race, um, but uh, also for um, for slavery and um, and also politically. I mean, we all know the tensions that uh, seem to continue between Israel and other countries in the Middle East, particularly. Uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians who are derivative of the Canaanite people. And, um, and so you have a whole world order we continue to struggle with that um, uh, has been born out of the uh, curse of Ham and, um, and then the justification for how we treat others who might be different on the outside than us um, uh, goes all the way back to this uh, biblical uh, narrative. So Robert, let's go to the, so um, not sure how we're doing on time. If I got a few minutes for these questions too. Um, uh, so a number of questions that um, I'd like for us to work through, and I'm not going to answer them. If you don't want to answer, then um, I'll just sip my coffee and look at you and see how beautiful you are. But, um, but why do you think this story is in the Bible is the first question. Oh, there's Latrell. Yeah. No. 
I can't hear. Is she saying something? I can read from my mute. Sorry, I had yeah, my mute. There you on. go. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you. Good to see you too. I'm still a little confused, but that's not uncommon. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it is he did, other than is the whole thing the the viewing of his father's yeah. nakedness. That's the whole thing. He broke the Levitical code. And, and that's a great insight. I mean, uh, there are some who say that uh, Noah had a bad hangover and he really didn't mean to be as harsh on Ham as he was, but um, he said things he shouldn't say uh, in the aftermath of having consumed the wine. Um, but the question I think you're pursuing is, did, did Ham deserve to be cursed just because he looked at the nakedness of his father? Well, because metaphorically, we've all been naked yeah. Uh, yeah. over and over in our lives. And that's what I was trying to make all this work in my mind. It yeah. seems, it seems kind of harsh to me. Well, and, and, then we, you know, we, the, the, why is this story in the Bible? And, and the question for me then, Latrell, is where are the places in my life that I have overreacted, that I have acted harshly, that um, I have acted um, uh, with judgment when I should not have judged, and certainly the situation um, was one that didn't warrant the response that, that I uttered. Great point. Under Levitical law, should they have left him lying naked? Um, well, the, the, the most biblical scholars would simply say the sons did, Japheth did what he should have done in Sham. They, they never viewed him, but they took care to um, make sure that his vulnerabilities were covered. Just don't look. Just don't look. Yeah. I'm confused like the trail. Now, Adam and Eve looked at each other naked, but they didn't realize they were naked till they, till they ate the fruit of the tree. And then, then they ran and covered. So is that where the code came from then after you're enlightened and you know you shouldn't be looking at somebody naked. Is that the, is that the code or? Yeah, I'm having a hard time hearing. Did you, did, uh, 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 can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, no, I was just saying that I, I'm like Latrell, I'm confused too. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve looked at each other's and they were naked, but they didn't realize it until after they ate the fruit of the tree. Right. And then they then they went and covered themselves. Yeah. And I guess uh, felt like it was not right to look at somebody naked. So yeah. is that where the code comes from? I and then so. it was supposedly uh, uh, not supposed to view the naked body? Yeah, yeah. The, the nakedness is an awareness of, um, um, one's presence outside of the presence of God. And so I think that's where the, uh, uh, from a psychological standpoint, we might uh, ponder the id and the uh, ego, but it becomes um, uh, an awareness that um, one is distinct from God and distinct from others. And that's a disruptive, uh, place to be would, would be how I would, would respond. But that, that is a little strange then that all the paintings you see, yeah. then of course that was many years later, but all the paintings you see, and even in the Sistine Chapel, they're all naked. Yeah. So. Yeah. Of course, you know, the, the, um, Pope, um, after the, uh, Council of Trent, 
um, had another artist go back and cover up the nudity. So uh, we've been struggling with uh, nudity throughout the history of the church. He, he thought Michelangelo was a little too, uh, too brash in um, uh, some of his techniques. But, <laughs> so Robert, let's look at the next question and see. Um, Yeah, so um, if, and I'll just, uh, I mean, the questions I had are what insights, if any, can this story provide? Um, what does Noah's drunkenness symbolize? Um, so let, let's maybe just ponder one or both of, of those questions for a, a moment. Um, but for me, I'd really, really love to hear um, you know, why is this story, do you think, in the Bible, and does it have any value, and if so, what are the insights, what's the value that this story can bring to, to our lives, individually or as a community? Or does it bother you that the stories in the Bible, this story is in the Bible? Well, it's two things for me. One is that, um, are you hearing me? Yeah, I'm trying to see who's talking. It's Ellen, but- Oh, okay, I got you, yeah. Okay, um, it's two things to me. One, it's an illustration of why we should not take the Bible literally. And uh, the other thing is that it, it's a good illustration of we're all flawed and uh, we cannot um, criticize a, a person perhaps who's, whose life mainly is showing that he, has, he or she has done good things, has meant well, has loved people, but at some point has had a fall from grace. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that does not destroy everything else that a person may have accomplished. That's uh, beautifully put. And uh, it is um, certainly, um, uh, those are words I hope we all uh, hear and words uh, by which we all live. Um, and the truth is that begins with uh, each of us. I was afraid, um, you were going to say it's a lesson on why we shouldn't drink. And um, <laughs> I, and uh, I overlooked that part of the canon, but um, I, um, I do think it's a lesson in responsibility. I think it's a lesson in forgiveness. Um, uh, I'd also say it's a lesson um, ultimately in, in our ownership of um, our finitude and our failure, but also our faith that um, God can take whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever we say, whatever we do, and um, still work through that to, um, to broaden uh, the kingdom of, uh, of God. And, uh, and ultimately, that's the um, ship we want to be on, right, is the one that's uh, sailing toward light and toward grace and toward um, uh, a broader community and not one that is sailing toward um, uh, judgment and um, divide. Robert, if I may, uh, the Old Testament and the Bible in general is big on honoring your father and mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, this fits right in line, mm -hmm. in my mind, mm -hmm. with uh, that almost overemphasis in the Old Testament. It's kind of driving that point home um, that uh, the, the Ham um, had an opportunity to um, uh, keep his father's honor up. But uh, he thought only of himself and mm. 
Yeah, and and Robert, that uh, brings, uh, at least in my mind, uh, this great comment about honoring your father and mother. Um, but it, the 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 great story in Luke about the uh, prodigal son, um, and uh, no matter what the wayward child does, the the father still accepts and loves the son, and. Um, welcomes him home. And, um, and so, you know, if you could rewrite this passage, um, wouldn't you uh, love to have seen Noah um, accept what Ham did, um, not embrace it, but still um, welcome him home? And, uh, and what do you do with the, uh, the parental curse uh, in the Old Testament that is balanced by the parental acceptance in the new. Hey, hey Robert. Yeah. Uh, uh, so this is Bill, Bill Cole. Hey, Bill. <laughs> uh, good lesson this morning. You really got us thinking. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Ellen just said really jumped out at me and, and spoke to me um, about about this this is a good example of how the, the Bible should not be read literally. Mm. Um, and you know if you if you realize how the Bible came to be, uh, and you mentioned you 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 suggested that when you talked about the retroactive reading mm. of this of this passage. Um, but if you know it, so so the Bible is written down long after um, the events that are are represented or spoken of. Um, and of course, we know that Genesis 1 through 11 um, is heavily mythical. Uh, it's, not, it's not so much historical uh, as Genesis 12 comes to be with Abraham and then the, you know, the beginning of the, uh, the, Jewish, the Jewish religion and system. But, but in those first 11 chapters where it's so mythical, um, you know, I, I picture the, um, I picture the writers of the, of the Bible pulling these oral traditions that had been around forever, uh, pulling them together and putting them down. Um, and, and so they're saying, they're asking big questions that were asked around the campfire when they were in small tribes. Mm -hmm. You know, how did, how did the world come to be? You know, and you get the creation story. Uh, and every, every, culture has a creation story. Um, this happens to be the one that we as Jews and Christians look back on, uh, and uh, Muslims as well, on the creation story. Um, and then, and then they're, you know, perhaps they're asking a question, uh, hey, why don't we like the Canaanites? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. why, why, why are these people so beneath us, and, and why are they so bad? And so they can go back and point to something in their own oral tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can say, well, it all goes back to Noah, you know, when, uh, when I mean, he put a curse on those people. Sure. Which is the same thing that, that happened in, uh, in the American South. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, they were cursed. I, I remember as a child uh, sitting in church on Sunday morning in my little Baptist congregation and our preacher telling us this. Mm -hmm. Uh, this sure. was still this was still being proclaimed, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, forty years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when I was a child, that would have been twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but um, but seriously, you see what I mean? I, I think um, I think they look back on uh, on these stories as um, I think we can look back on these stories as a way of predicting what happened. To humanity, racism, yeah. bigotry, um, uh, an emphasis on moral purity, on moral purity, and those Levitical codes that we we today um, don't look on in the same way at all. Those purity codes forbid the eating of uh, of, of, of pork. Yeah, you know, some of you probably had a pork chop for dinner last night <laughs> uh, and didn't think a thing about it, or shrimp, or whatever. Um, I'm not saying they're all in the same category, but I, I do think that a text like this helps us to understand um, 
that number one, human dignity is very important and we need to uphold it. Mm -hmm. But we all know that we have failed, all of us have. Mm -hmm. uh, as you pointed out, we fail as Noah did mm -hmm. um, in not treating his son with a little more mercy and dignity after he had broken the code. Mm -hmm. um, and we fail as in the same way that, that Ham did. Yeah. Um, because we too have not treated our elders with respect and dignity at all times, or others, whether they're elders or not. Uh, so I look at it as a way of saying, how do we get to be in this mess we're in? Yeah. You know, and this is a good example of how we got there. Got there. And and your your comments uh, uh, re remind me too, or bring to mind, um, why is it that we need stories to justify our behavior? So right. part, of, part of the whole Noah cursing of Ham is a story the Israelites needed to justify their attitude toward uh, the Canaanites. Yeah. And um, what are those stories or ways in which we approach the biblical stories that we need to tell to justify why we act or think or feel the way we do and um and our is our use of those stories uh really born of god or born of our own ego and yeah. and, I, and our own desire to justify what we feel yeah I think. It's kind of funny, Bill, you were on the left side of the screen and I was, I lost you and then you moved to the right side. So, uh, well, I'm trying to keep you on guard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, ma'am. I was just curious. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't appear from the scripture we read that, that God punished Noah for, for, for any of that, or even, whether there's scripture further down that says anything, but that Noah was still a good man. I was just curious at that. It focuses on Ham, but, but not on the actions of Noah. Yeah. And, and certainly the consequences in the biblical narrative and um, the darker, I don't mean the skin tone, the, the darker side of humanity reside with the consequences of Ham's actions and the, the covenant that God makes with Noah uh, that will eventually be uh, borne out in Abraham and, and all not through Christ, uh, that becomes the legacy of, uh, of Noah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it ties back into the comments I, I made earlier that um, I wish they had told this story in a, in a more prodigal son type context and, and, and how in reflecting back over their history would um, our own history and our own narrative have changed if they could have come to the, to the point of um, uh, acceptance and forgiveness um, and hope as opposed to the, the bitter uh, need for, for somebody to be judged, somebody to pay the price. Mm -hmm. I, the, ah. thing that, the thing that bothers me most about this story is that, um, you know, I mean, Canaan's oh, the to... one who really suffered. Yeah. Not, not Ham, it's Ham's son who suffers. Um, and, that, and, you know, I keep thinking about what Jeremiah says later, the great prophet, who would say, um, you know, there was a time when the, the sins of the fathers uh, will extend to the third and fourth generation. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Jeremiah says, but the day, the day is coming when every person will suffer for his own sin not the ones who come after them, um, which shows a real way of a real, a real uh, mark of progress in uh, mm -hmm. as, as human, as humanity moves along, you know. Uh, but so yeah, sorry. that's the part that bothers me the most. Mm -hmm. Poor Canaan. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I hope you can 
Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, ma'am, I can. Thank you. Good. And I, I agree very much so with Bill Coates because it we do want to see progress in our belief system, you know, in our ability to to forgive and um, move on. <laughs> mm -hmm. But because but I have been reading as I've told many people in Richard Rohr and right now I'm believing I'm reading in a book of his called The Naked Now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it talks about how important it is to come before God in contemplation and accept being in our naked now. <laughs> and that's that's kind of comical in a way, in going back to the Old Testament, it shows how much difference there is in so many things in the uh, present Christian beliefs and the Old Testament. I um, appreciate yeah. that. And I, I, I love Richard Rohr. I'm not familiar with that book. So you've given me something to uh, read. I, I appreciate that. Um, it is it is very good. It's it's more so about um, contemplation. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think that's where I want to leave us because um, one of the great uh, gifts of this lesson and or not this lesson, but this biblical text and and other texts like it. Um, is that, that uh, the wise soul will ask, what does this mean for me? Um, and one of the burdens that I carry in my own life for myself, but also for the Christian church in general, uh, is our tendency to see the Bible justifying what we believe and condemning uh, actions and beliefs of others with whom we disagree. And, um, and this is particularly true in the, in the church itself. And if we could come to a point of not reading text just about what it meant or what it means for others, but 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 at its most basic, naked level, what does this text speak to me? What does it call me not to be? And what does it call me to be? And if the orientation of the Bible and its application to my life could be first and foremost, before I attempt to apply the teachings of the Bible to others, I think the Christian faith, certainly the Christian community, would be a much healthier uh, body of which to be a part. And that begins with us. Um, it begins with great communities of faith, like the one of which you are a part, and um, and just know it truly is a privilege personally for me to be with you and to um, in some small way be a part of the, um, of, of the journey with you that, that we, we are privileged to share. So God bless you. Well, you certainly fill the shoes that I was talking about earlier. That was a great lesson this morning. I learned a lot, and I really appreciate some of the comments from uh, some of the other people. That is why I love this class, and I'm glad God brought me to it. We want to thank um, Robert this morning uh, for being with us. He is going to come back at the end of November and share another uh, Bible story with us, and we look